Good morning, everyone. Great day for a strawberry webinar, huh? Thanks for attending our webinar, Grow Your Own Strawberries. I'm Erica Johnson, and I coordinate the WSU Clark County Master Gardener Program. I'll be serving as moderator for today's talk. I have disabled microphones and cameras as best I can so that we can focus on our presenter. I've also closed the chat box for communication between attendees, but it's open to me should you have any questions. To find the chat box on Zoom, you'll look for the More tab or the three dots on your panel. If you click on that, you can send me a message, for example, if there's a problem with the sound or video. You can also post questions, which I will relay to our presenters periodically. You can also change your view option at the top if you'd like to see the full screen, um, and you can click on full screen mode. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers, Karen Palmer, Becca Martin, and Judy Seifert. All are WSU Extension Clark County Master Gardeners, and they have a combined 37 years of service with our program. Giving educational presentations is just one of the many roles they play with the program. Please welcome our first presenter, Becca Martin, and I'm gonna unmute her mic now. All right. Well, good morning and welcome to Growing Strawberries. Um, we're gonna walk you through everything you'll need to know for um, how to choose strawberries, plant strawberries, store strawberries. And before we dive in too deep, I wanna make sure that you know that this webinar is put together in conjunction with Jeanette Stair Green, who is another master gardener here in Washington State out in Clallam County. So she helped us prepare some of the materials that you will see today. Um, so I'm gonna be covering strawberry planting and maintenance for you this morning. I've grown strawberries for a number of years in all the different houses we've lived in and currently I am growing a couple different types of strawberries in my backyard with pretty good success. So it's a, it's a fun crop to grow. Today we're going to cover selecting varieties of strawberries that are appropriate for the Pacific Northwest. We'll also talk about how to plant your strawberries so they're productive and how to care for them so that they will uh, produce a good crop for you for a number of years. Then we'll move into some of the more common diseases and pests that we see here uh, locally in strawberries, so you are aware of what to be on the lookout for. And lastly, we'll cover how to properly store your berries when you've picked them so that, that they stay fresh for you the longest. Strawberries kind of group into uh, three general types. June bearers are ones um, that you might be most common, most familiar with if you've gone to a you pick farm. They have one main crop. Around here, it could be as early as mid-May, but typically late May into June. They pr produce a lot of runners. Um, and, they're, and they're typically known to be a flavorful strawberry. They're called June bearing because in the uh, longer, warm, late spring days that we have, it triggers the growth of their runners. And then in the cooler temperatures of the late summer and early fall, they uh, begin their flower bud formation for the next growing year. There's also ever bearers, or another type of strawberry. They do not produce, as their name suggests, forever or throughout the whole summer, but they actually have two crops. They produce berries in June and then again in late summer. They're, they differ from June bearing in that they produce fewer runners. Day neutrals are also a very popular type of strawberry to grow. They produce berries throughout the entire summer from June all the way up until the first frost in October. And again, they produce few runners. So there are some varieties that are specifically recommended for here in Clark County or in Western Washington. And just a few for the June bearing that are recommended for their disease resistance and for a good crop would be Puget Reliance, Puget Summer, Shooksin, Tillamook, and Hood. I know that um, from my experience going to UPIC farms, typically I've picked Tillamook and Hood berries. They're very popular to be grown at our demonstration gardens at Heritage Farms. We are growing the Shooksin variety of June bearing strawberries. 
Day neutrals are recommended if you want a crop that will last through the summer. There are quite a few varieties available. The ones that are recommended for our area are Albion, Seascape, Tribute, and TriStar. And lastly, we have some ever-bearing varieties that are recommended for our area. They are Fort Laramie and Quinault. Um, it's not quite as common to grow ever-bearing. We are growing them in our demonstration garden as well as the day neutrals. The day neutrals tend to be more flavorful and you have that continuous crop throughout the summer versus the ever-bearing where you're, you're lumped into two crops. When you're looking to choose which variety or type of strawberry you want to grow, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to make choices based on a couple different things. One, you wanna choose some that are known to do well in our climate. And as I just covered, there are quite a few to choose from that have been researched and recommended for Western Washington. You also wanna meet your own personal needs. For example, think about what, what you wanna use the berries for. If you plan on preserving berries, you might want to grow a June bearing crop because you'll have one solid harvest in one time. If you want something that will be picked throughout the season that you could uh, have for snacks or just general eating, you would probably lean toward a day neutral or an ever bearing. Uh, also thinking about where you're growing. If you're growing in containers, day neutrals or ever bearing would be recommended as they send out fewer runners. But if you want the best of both worlds, you probably want a bed of June bearing and a bed of day neutral so that you have both uh, one bountiful crop for preserving and then one also to eat throughout the season. And just as a, just so you know for um, productivity, the general rule for strawberries is that you will have one to two quarts of berries per plant. In June bearing, you will have about a half to one pound per foot row of berries for the first two and three fruiting seasons. Ever bearing is a little bit less of productivity. It's a quarter to a half pound per foot row. And then the day neutrals are quarter to three quarters pounds per foot row during the first year of life. And then a half a pound to a pound and a half per foot row for the fruiting years two and three. So as far as productivity goes, day neutrals do supply you with the most berries because they're producing over a longer period of time. There are a couple different ways that you can purchase your strawberry plants. In the late winter and very early spring, you would be able to find bundles of bare rooting strawberries. And then into the spring and even now, um, you would find individual potted plants. So if you're wanting to grow quite a few strawberries, you would lean towards buying a bundle of bare root plants. They're less expensive and you typically can buy 25 bare root strawberry plants for about $15 versus a potted plant that can run you know, a few dollars per plant. However, now in May, you will have no luck finding any bare root plants, but this would be a good time to get your soil ready for the next planting year and then know that in February or March, you'll wanna purchase your bare root stock. Just do remember whenever starting a berry patch, buy healthy, certified, disease-free plants from a reputable source. Strawberry plants do tend to accumulate and become more susceptible to, to diseases as they age. And so you do run a risk if you get plants from a neighbor or from other, another place in your garden that you're not starting with the healthiest plants your berry patch will not be as productive or last as long. And since a berry patch is an investment, we suggest you start with disease, certified disease-free plants to get the greatest return on your investment. Once you've chosen the type of strawberry you want and the cultivar, from there you're going to make sure you put it in the proper area of your garden. Strawberries do need full sun and by full sun, they can get by with six hours of sun sunlight each day, but they will perform best and you'll have a better crop if they get up to 10 hours of sun each day. You want an area with good air circulation so that they'll have less issues with um, diseases and fungus problems. You want well-drained soil. 
and you want your soil to be at a pH of six to six and a half. If you're planting into an existing garden area, avoid planting where members of the nightshade family have been planted previously. Those would be tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and such. They have um, a fungus that can that can harbor in the soil and, and affect your strawberries. Also, do not plant into recently plowed grass sod areas because there could be an issue with grubs in the soil, which would affect the roots of your newly planted strawberries. And remove all weeds from the area where you'll be planting. You don't want them to be in competition with your strawberries as far as uh, nutrients and water. Are there any questions so far? There, um, there are none. Perfect. Okay. So let's cover how to plant your strawberries. So there is a difference in planting the bare root versus planting an already grown strawberry. When you purchase your strawberry plants that are in a pot, it's very easy to plant. You simply dig a hole that's big enough for the root ball and make sure that the plant crown sits at the same level that it did in the plant. You water it, you walk away, and you're done. But when you're planting bare root strawberries, it's a little bit trickier because you need to make sure that you plant the crown of the plant at the appropriate place at the soil line. So if you plant too shallowly, your roots may dry out. If you plant too deeply, you run the risk of the crown rotting. So you want it just right in the middle of the crown. So to do this, you would dig a hole about five to six inches deep and wide enough to allow the roots to fan out. You want the mid crown of plant to be level with the ground and you might need to reposition it a little bit as you're back filling with soil and watering. So just um, on planting day of bare roots, uh, make sure that your mid crown depth, there it's a center plant in our diagram and uh, make sure it's at soil level mid crown and then you might want to go back the next day and verify that it hasn't settled in any deeper or, or pushed up any higher. And it's important when you are planting to keep the roots of bare root strawberries moist. And so uh, keep the roots in water for about a half an hour before planting. And then also keeping them in a shaded area will help reduce evaporation and drying out. Water the plant soon after planting because the fine roots can dry out. Strawberries are a very shallow rooted plant. Just most of their roots are in that top six inches of soil. So in general, strawberries do require uh, adequate water. So knowing how far apart to plant your strawberries is important because they have different growing habits. In our June bearing strawberries, they produce many runners. As you see in this picture below, there's many, many runners off of the main plant. And so you need to provide more space for them when you're planting. Ever bearers and day neutrals have, they do have runners, but they're just not as vigorous at putting out runners. And so they can be planted closely together. So let's look at how that placement looks in the garden. If you're planting in the ground for June bearing plants, they need to be placed 15 inches apart minimum up to 18 inches apart. So you'll see in this picture here on your planting year one, the plants are spaced three to four feet apart and then 15 inches apart. So that you would, as they fill in, you would have a row running down, a walking path running down the center of those two rows of plants. So then year two, all the runners have been sent out and filled up an entire area of one of the rows. And then I showed also a picture here of our raised beds at the demonstration gardens in Heritage Farms. Last spring, early, we planted six bare root June bearing strawberries into this bed. And this is a three foot wide by five foot bed. And this is what it looked like this week. So it fills up quite quickly you know, with all of its uh, runners. And so this year we'll have its first fruiting season. Day neutrals and ever bearing simply just need to be planted 12 inches apart. You can either do that in a row or in a raised bed, but just every square foot of space, you would be able to have a strawberry plant. And then you'll be removing the runners throughout the growing season. 
Once you've done your planting, you will want to place mulch between and under the plants. This helps keep weeds lower. It also helps maintain moisture and it keeps the fruit off of the ground. There are a variety of things you can use for mulch. In the picture of the day neutrals above here, you see straw being used. It's a very inexpensive mulch that you can use. Uh, you may also use black plastic and you see that at a lot of farms, but this cannot be used easily with June bearing strawberries. You may use it with day neutrals or ever bears where you're not going to be keeping the runners, but um, because if you use black plastic with June bearing, you won't have any soil exposed for those runners to root into. And the only downside to any of these mulches would be that slugs like to set up shop. And so you would need to, uh, because it stays moist, and so you need to be on the lookout for those uh, to protect your berries from slugs. For your first year of care, you will want to provide some fertilizer for your strawberry plantings. So after planting, you will fertilize at two weeks, six weeks, and 10 weeks. You would take your total amount of fertilizer needed for the plant and divide it into those three timings. So you're not, um, so depending on how large of a planting area you have, you would follow the package directions for how much fertilizer is needed, but then divide that by three and split up those applications across the two, six, and 10 weeks. For your first season of planting on June bearing plants, you will remove all blossoms. You want those plants to really focus on establishing good roots and sending out new runners. For day neutrals and everbearing, you only need to remove the blossoms for the first six weeks after planting, and then you can allow them to set blossoms and establish fruit. So you will get a small crop of berries your first planting year with everbearing and day neutral strawberries, but you will not get a crop from your June bearing until the following spring. For later years, you, you will wanna make sure to water your berries one to two inches each week, remembering that their roots are shallow. They're in the top six inches of soil. And so it's important to keep your soil moist and watered, especially while they're setting blooms and while they're fruiting. And then also for your June bearing, the soil needs to keep moist into September as they're setting up their buds for the next fruiting year. You would wanna pull weeds by hand so you're not disturbing their root systems of the strawberry plants. And you can fertilize based on growth. So look at your plants and see if they're healthy and see if they look like they might be suffering from any sort of nutrient deficiencies. June bearing, plants you would not want to fertilize though until after harvest if you so later on into july if you fertilize beforehand earlier in the spring you're going to tell the plant to produce really nice leaves and not so much fruit and the everbearing and day neutrals you may fertilize more throughout the growing season from spring until august so Strawberries typically are not very heavy feeders. And so that's again why you need to watch how much fertilizer you actually do need to apply. So looking at your plants will tell you what they need as well because too much nitrogen would result in large leaves and you want more fruit. So, so you've heard me mention runners on strawberry plants. Strawberry plants do both June bearing, ever bearing, and day neutrals. They send out runners from the main first plant that you are growing. And there are horizontal stems that run above the ground. The runner production is a long day response and it occurs typically when days are more than, day length is more than 12 hours long. They can be anywhere from eight to 18 inches long depending on the variety of strawberry you've planted. And those little plants that get started are the, called daughter plants. They're clones or gen, genetically identical to the mother plant that you started with. Runners usually arise once the harvest is over. 
When the daughter plant produces two to three sets of leaves, it will then start to root into the soil. And up until that point, it is pulling some energy and water from the mother plant. Once a runner starts growing roots and getting established, it will send out another runner of its own. That runner in turn will try to grow a runner. So they will just keep going along the way and you will have an entire chain of runner plants or of the daughter plants. Runners are good, especially for your June bearing plants because they increase the number of plants you have and the productivity of your patch, but they can cause problems. They will grow wherever they want to. That could be in the pathway. It could be too close to another neighboring strawberry plant. If there's too many runners are produced, it can crowd out existing plants and decrease productivity. It can cause problems with airflow. If a, a strawberry patch gets too thick with these daughter plants, it can also cause issues with shading of the plants. So we do need to manage the runners for our June bearing plants. Day neutrals and ever bearing varieties are very easy. You simply just remove all runners. We don't ever leave you any of them. Um, the plants of, of day neutrals and ever bears are not vigorous enough to maintain those daughter plants. So you, from them, you simply just want your crop. You do not want any runners being sent out or you don't want them to stay, you want to clip them. For June bearing plants, however, you do want to allow some of the runners to stay. That, that's how they multiply themselves. So you want to have the runners growing where you want them to grow. So you want them to fill in between the mother plants as space allows in your planting area. General rule of thumb is you do not want more than five to six plants per square foot and you do not want any of those runners on runners. So allow the mother plant to send out some of its daughter plants and allow those daughter plants to root. But if they start, or if when, they start sending out additional runners from those daughters, you want all of those to be removed. You also do want to remove any runners after September 1st. There's just not enough time for those runners to root very well and survive the winter. So it's a waste of energy from the mother plant to allow those to stay. You can also use these pins here that you see in the photo to move runners to locations in your garden bed or your garden path where you do want the runners to stay. And we're gonna look at this next, what that actually looks like. So for example, you would have your one original June bearing mother plant in the row and then your garden path on either side. And as the season goes on, she will send out daughter plants. Some of those are going to land in the row where you want them and the other ones are gonna land in the pathway where you will be walking. And so that's not a good place for them to be. And then eventually some of those daughters are gonna put out daughters of their own or granddaughters of the mother plants, however you wanna look at it. So what you can choose to do is move some of the daughter plants off of the pathway and back into the row where you want them growing. Then as we covered earlier, you do want to always remove those secondary daughter plants. And then we wanted to limit ourselves to five to six plants per, per square foot. And so you're gonna take off some of the daughter plants. Just look at the daughter plants and choose the one that maybe doesn't look as vigorous and that's the one you would choose to remove. So that when you're finished, you're down to the main mother plant and you've chosen to keep five daughter plants in that area. So your character strawberries does not end after you've harvested them. In the late summer and early fall, your June bearing strawberry plants are going to begin forming flower buds within their crowns. And during this period, you do wanna remember that they still need adequate water and light and nutrients because they are setting up for a successful crop for you for next year. The flower buds form prior to winter and then move into dormancy along with the rest of the plant. So when temperatures again start to warm in late winter or early spring, the plants revive and immediately begin the transformation of the flower buds into flowers sitting atop stalks. So there is some care that needs to be remembered for your June bearing plants. Within a week or so after harvest, you're going to want to renovate your June bearing strawberry plants. 
What that means is you're going to be cutting off all of the foliage from your plants about two to three inches above the crown. And then you're gonna remove all of that plant debris from your, from your garden bed. You can either dispose of it in a yard waste bin or if you have healthy uh, virus-free plants, you can compost that. And then you wanna make sure your rows are narrowed back down to eight to 12 inches. So by doing that, you're gonna thin out any old, weak or crowded plants keeping that rule of maximum five to six plants per foot. You can then also, this would be the time on your gene bearing plants to apply a fertilizer. And then you'll need to maintain your watering regimen until our fall rains return. Do you have any questions about renovating your gene bearing plant? There's a question about what type of fertilizer you recommend. A balanced fertilizer is perfectly adequate. So like a 10-10-10 is fine. When we will be sending home or, or emailing a follow-up with resources that do list out fertilizer requirements for strawberries. So you'll have that to refer to in the future. So day neutral and ever bearing care is a little bit differently done. We don't, we don't mow them as you would a uh, June bearing plants. But we do still go through and clean out any of the dead foliage. So in this photo, you're going to see some green leaves and some brown leaves. So you would go through with a pair of scissors and clip off any of the dead foliage on your plant and just do a general tidy up of the area. Make sure there are no runners left on the plants. Make sure you've cleaned up any berries that might have still fallen from because you they are still producing berries all the way up into first frost, so sometime in October. So make sure there are no berries left on the plants, no dead foliage, and, and just make it look tidier. That will also help to control diseases in your strawberry patch. Make sure to pull all weeds. And then you, if you need to do any thinning, now's the time to thin your plants back to the every 12 inches. Sometimes a runner escapes from your site through the growing season, so you might need to be on the lookout and make sure that you haven't allowed a runner to establish itself. In the winter, you're going to avoid any late season applications of nitrogen. They, it's not needed by your plants, and you don't want to encourage that new growth at this time. You do want to apply a thick layer of mulch, well, relatively thick, a few inches. Once the temperatures have dropped below freezing, that will protect the crowns of the plants. And you also need to watch for what's called frost heating. This happens if the crown of the plant is maybe planted a little too high. And when we get those heavy frosts, it pushes the crown of the plant too high up out of the soil. And you would need to uh, fix that for the plant. In the spring, when it's starting to warm up and you're starting to see some new growth, you will want to remove the mulch from around the plant so that you're not going to make it too warm. And it also allows the plant better air circulation at that time when it's needed. So remove it on a cloudy or rainy day late in the afternoon, uh, new white shoots before they start greening up. Strawberries bloom relatively early in the spring. Blossoms can be damaged below 30 degrees. So if frost threatens while your plants are in bloom, you will need to cover the plants again with a row cover or some other sort of protection. So you do kind of need to watch the weather to uh, time the removal of the mulch uh, so that you're not causing any potential damage if we have any cool nights coming. So longevity, I know that many people probably have had a strawberry patch or maybe their grandma had a strawberry patch that was in the same spot for many, many years and it did quite well. But research does show that diseases and viruses and pests can take their toll on plants and you may still have some berries being produced, but the reality is the productivity of the plant will decline from where it was when you first planted it. So it's important to note that June bearing plants really remain the most productive for about three to five years. Ever bearing and day neutral plants remain productive for two to three fruiting years. And after that time, the plants begin to decline and they will not provide as many berries for you. And so you would need to plant new plants and 
ideally in a new site so that you're moving them to a new soil location where if there are any virus issues, they would not be in your new area. So it seems like that might be a, a big task to pull out all of your strawberries after a few years and plant in a new site. But if you do remember, it's very inexpensive to start from bare root. It would be about a $15 cost to start new berries and have the full productivity out of brand new certified disease free berry plants. So it, it's worth your time for the harvest that you'll get. So at this time, I'm going to pass along to Karen Palmer. She's gonna cover diseases and pests to be on the lookout for in your strawberry patch. Thanks, Becca. Good morning, everyone. Um, I guess I'm looking for aphids in this photo. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've had, um, I've always grown the TriStar, which is an everbearing. I just love the flavor of those. But it was time for me to renovate, renovate my strawberry field. So uh, this year I planted a uh, Juneberry. So I'm getting to starting, I'm starting to learn all over again about uh, how to care for June bearing. So uh, as master gardeners, we always learn. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the diseases you may see um, in, your, uh, in your strawberry patch. Um, I will say that I have rarely had too many problems, but I just want you to be aware of some of the issues that you may have. So the first one is uh, that we're going to talk about is verticillium, and uh, this is a fungal disease, and uh, it also affects all the Solanacea family or the nightshade family. And Becca had mentioned not to plant strawberries where you have recently had uh, tomatoes or eggplants or potatoes, um, and this is why. If those plants happen to have verticillium, it is um, in the soil and it will come out and attack your strawberries. So this is why you wanna put your strawberries in kind of a different area. Uh, you, and also why you wanna start out with disease-free plants. Um, if you are rotating between different strawberry fields um, or, or different patches, then you can rotate your old patch with a, a cover crop, uh, like a grass or a cereal, and um, that will uh, replenish the nitrogen in the soil and, um, and avoid this particular type of disease. If you do experience verticillium, you wanna remove those plants and plants around it. And you also wanna use resistant varieties if this is a problem you repeatedly have. Um, it, it, uh, breeders are always trying to come up with new varieties that are resistant to verticillium. It's one of those uh, difficult diseases. But I have found that um, re research that shows that Tribute and TriStar are somewhat resistant to it. So those might be uh, good varieties to try if this is an issue you have had. I've never had this in my strawberries, so hopefully you won't either. Okay, next. This is also a disease I have never seen, but it can happen in the Pacific Northwest, a red steely. Um, it, this is a soil-borne fungus. It's a phytophthora, if you've ever heard of that. Uh, it can also attack things like cucumbers. Uh, the plants are gonna be stunted, um, they're gonna wilt, and they're gonna die back. And the roots, if, when you pull up the plant and you look in the roots, they have kind of a pinkish red tinge down through the middle of the root. And that's probably why uh, they come up with the name of red steely for this disease. Um, so this one is, since it's a soil-borne fungus, this is one of the important reasons to use a well-drained soil. Um, if you've ever had a history of red steely disease, uh, you do not want to plant strawberries there. Um, start out with good, healthy, disease-free plants. And uh, resistant cultivars are Hood, Rainier, and Shooksan. And I was glad to see this because I just planted Shooksan this year. 
And then there are some viruses that can attack strawberry plants. Um, there's a, one called yellow edge virus and one called crinkle virus. Uh, the symptoms are, are a lot the same. Um, you're gonna get leaf cupping, yellowing, um, kind of they're sort of stunted, they won't grow very well. So you won't have very much yield and the plants just won't look very vigorous. So if you don't have vigorous looking plants and you have been fertilizing, so you're pretty sure it's not a nutrient deficiency, then it, it could be a virus that has attacked them. Um, these are spread by aphids. So if you, uh, we're gonna go into aphids in a little bit, but this is one of the reasons you wanna control um, any kind of leaf hopping insects in your strawberries because they can spread disease around. Um, there are cultivars that are tolerant to the viruses. Uh, most of what I found, they aren't common varieties we find around here, but there is one called totem, which I think I have seen in nurseries before. So that is a cultivar that's tolerant if, if this has been an issue. Um, again, I have never seen any of these virus issues in my strawberries. This one I have seen. So this one um, is just brought on by cool, moist weather, which like today, uh, is very common here in the, in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, this is one you may see. see. This is why you wanna have good spacing for your strawberry plants, good air circulation. Um, you wanna not do overhead watering. It's best to use a soaker hose. Uh, for watering your strawberries. It, just keep as much moisture as we can off the leaves and in the, in the interior of the plant. Um, and another reason why you wanna clean up at the end of the season, as Becca was saying, cut off all the dead foliage, uh, clean away the mulch that you use to overwinter them, uh, just get good air circulation. If you do see some of this, you just, you, just pick off those sort of moldy, yucky berries and get them out of there. Um, any of the foliage that's showing this kind of moldy stuff, uh, get it out of there and usually they will recover uh, just fine as the weather dries out. Um, the spores are spread around by, by just wind or splashing rain. Um, so this is another good reason to use some kind of mulch, like a straw mulch, because you are gonna keep the spores from splashing up out of the soil a little bit. And again, there are some resistant varieties. There's that totem and the shook sand. Okay, so those are the main diseases. Uh, are there any questions so far on just disease issues before we get into insects and pests? There are none. Okay, perfect. As I said, you probably won't see any of those. And um, if you do and you, you're having trouble figuring out what's going on, that's why the Master Gardeners are, are at your beck and call to help you figure it out. Okay, root weevils. Um, the little guy on the bottom there is the adult root weevil. Um, they actually, the adults don't actually do much harm. If you see notched edges, on your uh, leaves, on the edges of the leaves, then that is a sign of root weevil. Um, they also attack uh, rhododendron, so you may be familiar with uh, rhododendron, <laughs> I'm having trouble saying this, root weevil damage. Um, it's the same thing you would be looking for in your strawberries. So it's not the adult that's the problem, except that they lay eggs in the soil, and at the top there, then those larvae hatch, and they are the ones doing the damage. They are feeding on the roots of your plant. Um, so you, you want to control weeds around your strawberries to uh, avoid attracting those root weevils and giving them a good place to hide. If you're planting a new strawberry patch for like next year, it's good to cultivate that in the fall and that will help cut up some, any of those larvae that may be hanging around. And the other good thing to do for these is beneficial nematodes, putting those into your soil. I've done that on um, rhododendrons before, and that's been very helpful. 
the it's a little bit of a trick though you can't just go out and, and apply the nematodes at any point in time uh, first where do you get those nematodes uh, you can find them in nurseries uh, even some places like backyard bird shop uh, will sell the they come usually as a, like a little sponge and you put the sponge in a bucket of water and let it sit for a while and then you pour that water around on your plants the nematodes are just something very small. You really can't see them with the naked eye. But your soil has to be warmer than 53 degrees and it, you have to keep it moist, have it the soil moist before you apply them and keep it moist for several days afterwards. Uh, so nematodes are normally only available in late summer and early fall because that's the best time to apply them. So if you're having a problem in your strawberry, patch with uh, these root weevils, then in the fall, look for these nematodes and uh, try applying those, and that might just do the trick. Uh, we talked about aphids. The biggest problem with aphids are that they're spreading viruses. Um, so if you're seeing kind of puckered leaves on your strawberries, look on the underneath side. That's normally where the aphids are gonna be hanging out. Uh, also, so if you see a lot of ants, they are attracted to the honeydew, which the, the uh, aphids excrete. So that could be a sign uh, if you're seeing a lot of ants running around that you do have aphids and you can start looking for them. Um, also, if you are applying too much nitrogen, that encourages uh, aphids to come to your plants. It's like a little siren call of something they want to eat there. You want to attract beneficial insects. If and this is also useful information for your vegetable garden um, or any of your flower beds. If you have an aphid problem, um, you want the beneficial insects hanging around because they love to eat the aphids. If they're on your strawberries um, and it's becoming a problem, you can usually just uh, blast them off with a hose, you know, a good strong spray and blast them onto the ground and then maybe the birds or those beneficials will find them. Um, or you could try something like an insecticidal soap. You just uh, kind of smother them with that um, and that won't harm the strawberries, and, but it will kill the aphids. So just be, just be on the lookout for aphids. I don't have a problem with aphids because I have currants uh, planted right near my strawberries and aphids love currants, so they gravitate towards them. So uh, that's my aphid magnet and keeps them off my strawberries. Okay, here's the big problem. You are gonna have birds. They can spot these strawberries, they're little bright red beacons, and they can spot them from a mile away. You may get by, I know down at the Heritage Farm, they haven't found ours yet, but I'm sure they will. So you might get by a little time without uh, the birds coming in and attacking them, but um, it's not gonna last forever, so you might as well start planning for it. Um, they will come down and peck on the, the top of the strawberries and just kind of ruin it. So you are gonna use, need to put up some kind of frame to hold the netting. Um, you can't just lay the netting right over the strawberry plants because the birds will still just land there and put their beak right down through the netting and still peck at the berries. So you need to hold it up off the berries, uh, the berry plants a little bit. If you secure your bird netting down to the ground, um, you know, if it goes all the way down to the ground, that will also keep squirrels out, who can be another big problem. So we're gonna show you some examples of uh, bird netting supports and how you would go about putting that up. So here's uh, one of our raised beds at the Heritage Farm. And you can see this is what you would call a high tunnel. It's uh, kind of way up over the plants. Uh, be, because this bed could be used for, you know, something like a, you know, broccoli or Brussels sprouts or anything like that in the future. So uh, we wanted this one to be a little higher than it would actually need to be for strawberries. But um, the picture in the middle, you can see there's just a, a rebar pounded into the ground right on the inside of the raised bed. If you don't have a raised bed, you can just pound it into the ground. And then you just put a PVC pipe just 
put it down over the rebar and bend it over to the other side. And that's as simple as it is. And then it'll just stand there like that. Um, then you can get these clips uh, to put the, to hold the bird netting down to the vertical supports of the PVC. You can see on the right hand side, the picture shows one of these little white clips and it just snaps right over the PVC. And they come in different sizes based on the size of the PVC pipe you're using. I think in this case, it's half inch. Um, if you don't have those little clips, feel free to use a binder clip. You know, they work fine too, a large binder clip or zip ties. Uh, zip ties are just a little more difficult because you have to cut them off. But so it's, it's nice to have something you can snap on and off. Uh, this is a little low tunnel I built over um, my little low strawberry raised bed. This is my new planting this year. I probably planted them too close together. I'm still learning. But uh, this is just rebar that um, I happen to have access to a welding machine and I know how to weld. So I welded the rebar together, just uh, one long straight rebar piece and then I bent some other pieces of rebar and welded it together and then just put uh, chicken wire over it. I just wired down some chicken wire. And so this is very lightweight. I can go out there and just flip it over and uh, tend to my strawberries or harvest and then flip it back over, flip it back on. And this has been very effective to keeping birds, squirrels. I haven't even had a raccoon problem. Um, it's not attractive, but it, it works. And so it's just another idea. I'm sure there's lots of creative ways um, people come up with to keep the birds out of their strawberry patch. So these are just uh, kind of two of them. The other little problem you have are these cute little voles. They look like a little mouse and they will tunnel. Um, they also love strawberries, so they will find them and they kind of tunnel under from somewhere else and they come right up next to your strawberry plant. So if you're getting nibbles on your strawberry, but they're not on the top like a bird would do, I, it's probably a vole. Um, so you just kind of look around for a little hole. It's, it's not going to be very big, but it'll just be a little hole um, that you will find close to your strawberry plant. And that's, that's probably what's happening there. They will feed on the roots. So you want to deal with them. The easiest way is to use a mousetrap. Um, I use peanut butter, but also little small pieces of apple will attract them. I just set it very close to the, the tunnel and or the little hole where they're coming up and they will usually find it pretty quickly. If you're using a raised bed, the best thing to do is put hardware cloth on the bottom of it and you want to attach that hardware cloth very securely, uh, very close together because if you just put in a, a nail uh, a foot apart, then they will still find a way to get in between that. So you want to put them uh, a nail or, or however you're holding the hardware cloth onto the bottom of your raised bed. You want to do that every few inches. This will also keep uh, moles out if you have a mole issue. Um, and again, this is useful for any raised bed, whether it's for your vegetable garden or for your strawberry patch. Um, putting hardware cloth on the bottom will keep out a lot of the burrowing varmints that you don't want in there. Any questions on diseases and pests? If I, as I said, um, most of these are not a problem. You might get some gray mold um, and you will get birds. Um, other than that, those are the two main issues I have ever seen in my strawberries. Karen, there mm -hmm. is a question that's asking for you to advise on insecticide soap solution. Oh. Um, I don't know. Well, I'll try to look that up and we can put it in the notes we send out. I just buy insecticidal soap, the concentrate, and, and, uh, and so I don't know of a homemade solution. Uh, there may be one out there that's, that's university recommended. We can look and, and uh, provide that in the handout information we send out. There's another question now saying, what about slugs? 
Oh yes, yeah, slugs, I'm sorry. I, I kind of get use that as a, <laughs> consider those a given. Yeah, slugs will find your strawberries, even in a raised bed. I get them, they crawl up the side of the raised bed. Um, it's, it, you know, you just deal with, you have to deal with the slugs. They will eat the strawberries. They will, you know, munch on them and make them gross. Um, so you do need to be on the lookout constantly for slugs and just do whatever you normally do for slugs is what I would say. You can, you can hand pick them. You can put down, um, you know, any kind of slug bait that you feel comfortable using. Uh, some people use, you know, beer in a, in a little cup that's, that's sunk into the ground. So the slugs are attracted to the beer. Um, you could try lining if it's a raised bed. Some people line it with copper because they don't like to crawl over the copper. Um, I just use slug bait. Great, thanks, Karen. Mm -hmm. Well, hi, I'm Judy Seifert. Can you hear me? Can. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, thanks, Beck and Karen, for all the information about selecting and growing beautiful, healthful strawberries. Let's talk about the buckets of berries that you'll soon be able to harvest. If you have any questions during our presentation, you can type them in the chat box and Erica will relay them. Uh, but we are going to send you links to the National Center for Home Food Preservation and WSU Safe Preservation sites, so you'll be able to refer to those. Nothing says summer like homegrown strawberries. Strawberries are best when harvested in the morning when it's cool. When harvesting, choose those that are full, dry, glossy, and have their green caps. Keep the caps on until you're ready to eat them or process. Toss any berries that have mold on them or have been eaten into by those critters. The most nutritional berry is the one that's eaten soon after harvest. Don't wash your berries before storing them. B stored berries should be dry. Wipe off any loose soil with a dry cloth. Now I've seen some internet posts about washing berries in a mixture of vinegar and water or baking soda and water, and it's supposed to keep the berries for longer periods. I cannot find any research-based information to support this method. I presume it's to wash off any pesticides, insecticides, um, critters, um, spores, that sort of thing. Um, but I do know that if you, if you uh, wanted to do this, vinegar certainly wouldn't hurt the flavor of your berries but you must get the berries totally dry before they're stored away or they will start to decay within a couple of days. So you place your unwashed or thoroughly dried berries on paper towels in a shallow container with a loose fitting lid. A tight lid will trap natural gases that will accelerate ripening. A loosely wrapped plastic bag would work just fine. You store it in the crisper in your refrigerator um, properly stored strawberries should last for one week. Check them every few days. Remove any moldy berries immediately. If your family snacks from the fridge, be sure to tell them to rinse the berries before they eat them. Berries can lose half of their vitamins in a week of storage, so you don't want to hang on to them very long. Are there any questions about storing fresh berries? There are none. Okay, thank you. If you'll not be using the berries within a week, you have several options for preserving them for future use. The fastest and easiest preservation method is freezing. Your method of freezing depends on what you intend to do with them. One versatile option is IQF, individual quick frozen. Uh, strawberries can be frozen whole or sliced in a single layer on the baking sheet. Freeze it for a few hours until it's firm and then store in freezer bags or freezer containers. With this method, you can remove only what you need at a time. This is also a great way to store homegrown berries when you're waiting to harvest enough for a batch of jam. Be sure to remove as much air as possible. Air is the enemy of frozen foods. Vacuuming, vacuum sealers are great for removing air and allowing a longer freezer life. Strawberries can also be packed either whole or sliced in water, syrup, or juice in freezer containers. You can use as much or as little sugar as you wish. 
you can make a heavy or a light syrup, or you can use honey or artificial sweetener uh, to make a syrup, or you can use straight fruit juice, either apple juice or grape juice, whatever your family likes. Be sure to completely cover the fruit with the syrup and leave proper headspace. This would be for strawberries that you intend to bring out, just maybe to be for ice cream toppings or possibly to go into smoothies, that sort of thing. But you're gonna get a big chunk of strawberries and juice when you defrost them. Use specific freezer specific containers. Do not use remargarine, reuse margarine or cottage cheese containers for freezing. These are single use containers. They're not moisture vapor resistant and they do not produce airtight seals. If you use these, some moisture will be likely lost and the result in a freezer burn. The same holds true for bags. They must be freezer bags, not just storage bags. Food stored in these containers may be safe to eat, but they'll be poor quality. Be sure to label and date each container. Berries can be stored in the freezer for up to six months. Freezing strawberries will cause a small loss of vitamins compared to fresh strawberries. For more information about safely freezing berries, please refer to the National Center for Home Food Preservation and the WSU resources that are being emailed to you. Are there any questions about freezing strawberries? There are none. Thank you. Canning strawberries. Another way to preserve your harvest is by canning strawberries. They're considered high acid, as is most fruit, so you can process it in a boiling water bath. Unfortunately, home canned strawberries become mushy, they lose their color and their flavor, so it's not really recommended. However, you can preserve the taste of summer for your friends and family to enjoy all year. Strawberries can be made into syrup, jam, jelly, freezer jam, no sugar jam, low sugar spreads, or old fashioned preserves. It's important to use the correct tested recipe and processing for each product. recipe. Be sure to follow recipes exactly. Don't double the batch as that is the main reason jams and jellies don't seal. Common pectin is usually made from citrus rinds or apples. Brands you might see in a grocery store are SureGel, Certo, MCP, Ball, Mrs. Wages, Wages, and Pomona's pectin. They come in no sugar, low sugar, freezer jam varieties so you could get the right pectin for the right application. When using pectin, be sure to follow the recipes included with each package and use safe tested recipes or procedures from trusted sources, such as WSU and the National Center for Home Food Preservation. If your recipe calls for added lemon juice, it's important to not skip this step and to always use bottled lemon juice with canning. Headspace is very important in canning, so make sure your headspace is only one quarter inch for jams and jellies, and be sure to measure that. Home canned berries retain the same nutrition as the day they were canned. Added sugar would affect the nutritional value, but the vitamins of the berries will still be there. Do you have any questions about canning strawberries? There is one about freezing, and it is, do you not wash the berries before freezing them? Yes, when you're processing, you just don't wash the berries before refrigerator or fresh storing. But when you go to process, you're gonna remove that green cap, you're gonna wash them, rinse them in cool water and then shake the water off and then process them. Slice them, freeze them, can them, whatever you're gonna do. Okay? Great. All right, dehydrating strawberries. Dehydrated strawberries are one of my favorite snacks and they're very easy to make with an electric dehydrator or even your oven. They're excellent for snacking or adding to breakfast cereal, muffins, oatmeal. For even drying, berries should be sliced uniformly with all slices being the same thickness as much as possible. Safely dried berries should be pliable but not sticky and have no visible moisture. Times can vary depending on your dehydrator, on the fruit, the moisture content of your berries, um, so be sure to check each berry as you're taking out of the dehydrator, give each one a little squeeze and a touch to check it. The moisture content of home dried fruit should be about 20%. 
When the fruit is taken from the dehydrator, the remaining moisture in it may not be distributed equally among the pieces because of their size or their location in the dehydrator. So they should be conditioned prior to storage. Conditioning is the process used to equalize the moisture. It reduces the risk of mold growth and, and allows for a longer storage. To condition, take the dried fruit that has cooled and pack it loosely in plastic or glass jars and seal the containers. Let them stand on your kitchen counter for seven to 10 days. Every day you're gonna shake the jar to separate and redistribute the pieces. The excess moisture in some pieces will be absorbed by the drier pieces. If condensation develops in the jar, that means there's too much moisture in the berries. So return all of the fruit back to the dehydrator for a little more drying. After conditioning, pack and store in airtight containers in a cool, dark spot, and your dried strawberries can last up to a year or longer. You can also use strawberries for fruit leathers, either alone or mixed with other fruits. Dehydrated berries will lose about half of the nutritional value over time. Are there any questions about dehydrating berries? No. Great. So please check the WSU Master Food Preservers website and Facebook page for information about home preserving and face food safety. That's being emailed to you. You can, you can ask a question on the Facebook page and one of the administrators will get back and answer you. If you have any questions, you can call the Master Food Preservers helpline Monday through Friday, and that phone number is being sent to you. And all of this information will be mailed soon after the conference, after the um, webinar. And I hope that you have uh, learned a little bit about preserving your berries for longer use. Thank you. So there was one question, and I'm going to um, start with you, Judy. Um, do you have sources um, for bare root plants that are certified disease-free and that have a wide variety of cultivars? Um, Becca could probably answer that better. Okay, Becca, you're unmuted. Okay, yes, for bare root strawberry plants, <clears throat> I know that Rain Tree Nursery, which is located here in Washington State, they, they do sell a wide variety of cultivars. I checked on their website yesterday because I was just curious to see if any of the nurseries still have any bare root in stock and they are sold out for the year. But if you look uh, later on into this calendar year or early in the next calendar year, you would be able to find them. You could also be put on their email wait list for when those varieties become available again. And then as well as Rain Tree, I believe that it was Territorial also sold bare root strawberry plants. And I don't know if One Green World sells bare root, but I do know they sell individual plants and they still had some available. And then obviously places like our local nursery center still have potted strawberry plants available at this time. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, any other questions from folks as we close out?